Okay. So um, I am Kayla Bodie. I'm the program manager here with the Division of Child Care, um, and I oversee the background check unit. We do have a couple of our staff on the call. Our program coordinator, uh, Brenda Burr, is on the call. You can see her beautiful face there. And Cynthia Smith is also here from our unit. Um, and Cynthia, she covers all of our hits. So um, she sends out letters to applicants and, and she gathers data. Um, so she, she's she been here in our unit for a while. She's got a wealth of knowledge and you've probably spoken to her at some point in time. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to make sure that I'm sharing my screen. So I'm gonna turn off my camera while I'm doing that. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to pop them in the chat box. Brenda is gonna be watching that chat to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and she will also put her contact information, mine's already there, but um, Brenda is a supervisor here in our unit. So if you have questions, you can always give her a call, shoot her an email, and we'll be happy to help. And with that being said, let's go ahead and get started on today's training. Okay, so we are going to talk about background checks for child care providers today. And the first thing that we want to do is give you some updates about things that are happening here within the division, um, any news that have to do with background checks. So the division will no longer be accepting receipts for your NICAR INA subscriptions after June 30th of this year. Uh, currently, child care facilities are eligible to be reimbursed for their first year of subscription. So if you have uh, not been reimbursed for that first year, it's only the very first year, uh, you can send in your um, invoices that have been paid. And if you um, would like, we can put that email of where to send those in the chat box. But those are only going to be able to be turned in until June 30th. After that, we will no longer be accepting any more invoices. So if you have not been reimbursed, please get those in. If you have uh, peers or you know other uh, directors in your field and they have not done that as well, have them go ahead and submit. Um, it's $150 for that annual subscription. So we are happy to kind of help you guys take that little bit of that burden away. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, email that email that Brenda just put in the chat box. You can also call our main line um, and they will get you some assistance. So the next thing that we want to talk about is we want to discuss um, potential employees that have lived out of state in the last five years. So if you have an applicant that has lived um, out of state in the last five years, they must have background checks from those states. Um, if this is not completed, it'll delay the process. It, it will result eventually in a not approval. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We will have our contact information um, all in this slide, as well as we've already put it in the chat box. Reach out to us if you have questions for those out-of-state background checks. We want to help um, to, to not delay the process for you. All right, and so uh, the next thing we want to talk about is if you have an applicant that's reaching their two-year expiration on the child maltreatment checks, uh, please make sure to go ahead and get those submitted through the central registry. Um, applicants will not be moved to approved without a completed child maltreatment, so they will stay in provisional and that will delay the process of getting them approved. If you provide summer care, um, we, have, we have lots of out of school time facilities and may have applicants have out of state, go ahead and get those documentations all requested. Um, try to get those out of state requests in. It's, it's nearly the end of school now, um, but if you haven't done that, go ahead. That way you have a results of time for the summer seasons to start for any camps or out of school times that you may be doing. So now we're gonna talk about who needs a background check. Um, and so background check, we have three components. We have the maltreatment criminal and the FBI. 
So all staff in childcare facilities need a maltreatment. That includes your janitors, um, volunteers, student observers, any therapists, they're all going to need a child maltreatment check. The Arkansas State Criminal Check, all of your staff, janitors, therapists, um, anyone that's on staff with children are going to need a criminal. Your volunteers and your student observers are in a gray area, depending on how much they are in your facility, how often, um, what their role is with the children. If they are in any type of supervisory role, then they would need completed background checks. Um, just reach out to your licensing specialist to discuss with them what their role is going to be in your facility and they will help you and, and guide you to see if you only need the maltreatment for those volunteers and observers or if you need to complete the criminal and the FBI as well. And again, the FBI is required for all staff. That includes your janitors, your therapists, um, and this also includes your transportation staff. So anyone who is unsupervised, counts in your ratio, has staff roles, um, they need to have a background check. And when do these expire? So the federal FBI check, which you all will think of probably the fingerprint check, that is good for five years. Your state criminal is good for five years. And then your child maltreatment does need to be um, updated every two years. Do we have any questions so far on who needs a background check or how often? And I do wanna let you know that we have these slides in a PDF format. Um, there's some links and other things that you uh, would have access to. If you would like a PDF version of these slides emailed to you, you can put your email in the chat box and we'll make sure to get a copy to you after the training. All right, we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk about some disqualifying offenses. So you can see the full list um, in your licensing requirement book. It's gonna be under section 110. There's a long table and list of disqualifying offenses. So uh, these disqualifying offenses are going to be categorized in two different ways. They're either gonna be a misdemeanor or a felony offense. And depending on, um, though the severity of the, the offense would give us a more in-depth look if they're going to be eligible. So when you're looking at these in your regulation book, um, just these are just some examples. There's a long list, but um, assault on the first, second, or third degree. If that is a misdemeanor charge, um, we are going to look for the conviction date. If it's been over five years, they're going to be eligible. If it was a felony assault in the first, second, or third degree, then we're gonna look at their conviction date and we're gonna say, has it been 10 years because it is a felony? So when you're reading through, that is what that um, regulation book is meaning when it talks about the five and 10 years uh, from the conviction date, just so that you're not confused about if this means that they're not eligible at all. So if they had a resisting arrest charge and it was a misdemeanor from 14 years ago, or even from six years ago, um, they would be eligible for employment with your child care facility. And so we won't go into too much detail about this. We just want providers to understand what your regulation book is saying so that if you do have applicants that come in and they're upfront and honest about their past and maybe some convictions that they do have, you'll know already going into it whether or not this person may not be eligible to work. So um, when in doubt, you can always call us, ask us questions, and we always recommend, you know, submitting those applicants and let us take a look at it so we can make that determination. So the second round of offenses of what we want to talk about is um, permanently prohibited offenses. So when you're looking in your regulation book, these are going to be the ones that are listed at the top, top of the list. Um, these do not, um, it does not matter if it's a misdemeanor or a felony, I believe all of these charges, there is no misdemeanor version, but these are going to be your severe charges. So um, murder, kidnapping, arson, abusive and endangered or an impaired person, um, sexual assault. So those are going to be your more severe um, charges and, and convictions. So anything that's up there in the top of, of those tables, they're not going to be eligible at all. It does not matter how long it has been since they were convicted. 
Does anyone have any questions about um, disqualifying offenses or where you can find that full list? So now we're going to talk about the electronic background check system. Um, all licensed programs must use the National Information Consortium of Arkansas, or NICAR for short. Um, you will see that abbreviation along with INA. Um, those are the same system. A background check through NICAR includes the state criminal background check, your federal background check, which is your fingerprints. Um, it also includes the National Sex Offender Registry and the State Sex Offender Registry. So providers must register for a subscription account with NICAR in order to run background checks. And another key point is that this system does not run child maltreatment checks. So you must submit a separate child maltreatment registry request um, for your employees through the central registry. They have their own online system um, that is not part of NICAR. So uh, just to kind of keep those separated. Any questions? All right. So now we're going to go through step by step the process of submitting those background checks. Now that you have your account, you're going to log in to your NICAR system. Actually, let me back up. You're going to complete your consent form first. So now that you've subscribed, the first thing you want to do is um, complete your consent form because once you log in, you're going to need this to upload. Um, so this is the request for criminal background check form. You will also hear the term consent form because that is what it is. It's giving us consent to review this person's background and it's notifying them of their rights, um, the Privacy Act and, and their rights on challenging their background. So when you open this form, uh, you're gonna see the very first question is one of the most critical. It says a reason for background check. Please make sure that you are marking that correctly. Um, for everyone in this group, it should be child care. Now you may have a license um, that you are a child care facility, but maybe you also do other things. Maybe you are also considered a child welfare or um, maybe you're also under the DDS facilities or you know, a Medicaid facility. Um, or you may be a public school, and so you may also submit applicants under the Department of Education. But for our purposes and for these employees, um, if they're going to be working in your child care facility, make sure that you select child care. If you don't select that and you select the, the wrong reasoning, um, it will be not approved. So, Right, and we've got a link there to the consent form. Um, and we'll also have a link to our website, which is a great place to visit because it has all of these steps and it has the links in each section. So once you submit this form, you're going to get a copy of it sent to the email that you have put in. And this is the most critical part of the entire background check process. This is where most all of the mistakes that we see that cause a delay happen. So the very first page is going to be the applicant's information. So you're going to have that reason for background check, which is say child care, your facility name, and then your facility number. That number must match a licensed facility within our system. So if you don't put in the correct number there, or you put in a number of a facility that is not licensed, it's going to be not approved. Verify that all your applicant's information is correct there. On the second page is where they're going to be signing and notarizing and getting it notarized. Make sure that the dates match. The applicant cannot sign on 5-1 and the notary sign on 5-2. The notary is watching the applicant sign and verifying their identity. Those dates have to match. The stamp needs to be legible. Um, all of the information needs to be filled out. And so that second part, that second page is where we see a lot of mistakes. So just please make sure that that information is correct and that the notary has completed it correctly. The third page is the challenge information um, and that is just a signature and a date. 
If you upload this information and you realize that you've made a mistake, you can always reach out to us. You can call us, email us, let us know, hey, I've made a mistake. I put the wrong number. I put the wrong you know, birth date or I, something was wrong and missed the notary stamp. You can correct that and send it to us and we can upload it for you. You don't necessarily have to resubmit your applicant and get have to pay again and go through the whole process. So reach out to us if you make a mistake, we'll be happy to help. Any questions about the consent form and what needs to be filled out? All right. So now that you have completed your consent form, you are going to log in to your NICAR or INA account. And I've got a screenshot here just to show you what the front page looks like. You should see this red banner that says Arkansas Department of Public Safety at the top. Once you're logged into the system, you will click on the search tab. This is where you're going to fill out the applicant's information. I always recommend uh, to have a copy of the applicant's driver's license with you while you're completing this section because there are, um, there are a few different details it's going to ask you that are easily found right there on that driver's license. And so uh, make sure that this information matches exactly what is on the applicant's driver's license. When they go to get fingerprinted, they're going to be verifying this information using their ID or their passport. So make sure that the spelling, the first and last name, the date of birth, all um, match correctly. If you see you know, that this information is different or maybe that person has been married or their name has changed or there's anything that needs to be changed, you can always have them update their driver's license. Um, if that is not an option, you wanna make sure that you are using the name that is on their driver's license. They will be turned away from fingerprinting. So uh, you're going to see the, the section here that says signed consent document. That's where you will upload the document that we just discussed. So your notarized consent form will go here. And then under purpose, you're going to make sure that you are selecting CHI child care. So it's going to say CHI child care, non-DHS request. That is the purpose that you should be using. Um, you may have some additional options here depending on your facility, but if you are um, putting this applicant in and they're applying for a position within your child care license facility, you will need to select child care. If you are a facility that has um, child welfare options as well, you would have to uh, run your applicant under whichever area they're going to be working if they're going to work in both you would have to submit them under both child care and child welfare. So if you have multiple purposes there and you're not really sure what to use or which, um, what the difference is, give us a call. We'll be happy to walk you through it. Um, most of you are just only going to have the CHI option. So be sure that that is what you are selecting. The next um, option here is going to say search FBI and state. And that is going to pop down the FBI information that's going to ask you about their eye color, their hair color, their height, weight. And again, that's where it's really important to have that driver's license. Um, and, and that's going to make it a lot easier on you putting this information in. Any questions on what needs to be submitted? All right. So once you uh, click the next button, it's gonna ask you to review your work. So please make sure that you take that extra time, you know, just review what you have put in. It's gonna save you money, you know, if you have to resubmit because there's an error. Um, a lot of times we'll see like on the date of birth, they may put in the date that they're submitting this. So you get in a hurry, you've been typing, you know, today's date um, and you may accidentally do that. So just take that time, read through, make sure that you've got it correct because Arkansas State Police will not reimburse you if you make an error and you have to resubmit. So it's gonna cost you additional money. Um, after um, you've, you've put this in, if you think that you've made a mistake, you can go back. 
go back to step one, change your, your information, make sure your consent form is uploaded again and hit submit and go forward. You can always go back. It's not gonna erase everything. It gives you the option. Once you've completed this and everything is good, you've submitted, you're going to get a transaction number. This is what you're going to need for fingerprinting. Um, and so just a tip here, the search ID number and transaction number are the same thing. Um, you just add the CHI 00 to the beginning of it. And you can see in our example here, if you look, the search ID is 3210364. Your transaction number is exactly the same. So when you schedule your fingerprints, it's gonna be CHI for childcare and then 00, and then 3210364. So that's just a tip if you're needing your transaction number to schedule fingerprints, it's um, easily available. Any questions? All right. So uh, before you schedule your applicants uh, time to go get fingerprinted and you, you're making that appointment, go into your NICAR account and make sure that they're no longer in your pending tab. So you've got, you know, your several tabs at the top of your account and um, you're going to see a pending tab. Make sure that they're no longer there. They should be under the history tab. Um, this just means that state police have completed their portion and they're ready to be fingerprinted. Most of the time this happens instantly, so they should instantly be under your history tab. However, if you entered any information incorrectly or the applicant has lived out of state within the last few years, um, it may take them a few extra days to, to process through and they'll be in pending. So you just want to kind of make sure of that before you send them to get fingerprinted. Um, if they're not under your history tab, they won't be able to be fingerprinted. And again, this rarely happens, but um, we have seen it happen before and we don't want to waste anyone's time of going and get fingerprinted when it can be avoided. So double check, make sure they're under your history tab. And then you can go ahead and schedule your fingerprints. You can follow the DHS fingerprint link here. And it's very easy to follow. You're just going to click make an appointment and then you're going to click fingerprinting. Once you do that, it's gonna ask you some information. So it's gonna ask you for the applicant's name and then it's going to ask you for their transaction ID, which is what we just talked about, that CHI. Then you're gonna put in your numbers. So the zero, zero, um, and then whatever the rest of the numbers are there. And then um, it's going to ask you to put in an email uh, for notifications um, once you get through this, this next section. And so I wanna talk just for a second about that. If you're a director or you're an HR um, representative or whatever your role is, if you are submitting background checks, don't use the same email every time you are scheduling your applicants. Eventually the system is going to think that you're the same person. And so it's, it's thinking you're already scheduled to get fingerprinted. So use the applicant's email address, let them get that notification. It's a reminder that it's scheduled. It tells them when to go and where. If you need to have them forward or print that out for you, that's fine. Um, but I would not recommend to use your email every single time, even though it's easier as the director for you to get that and just print it out for this applicant. Um, eventually it's going to stop letting you get those notifications. So just a little a tip there. Um, also, if you are resubmitting this applicant because their first fingerprints were rejected, you will see an option to put in the E number. Um, you would have received a letter in the mail from Arkansas State Police that says it was rejected. And there's a long E number and it would go here for you to schedule that second print submission. So does anyone have any questions on scheduling fingerprints? Okay, we're gonna move on. So you're gonna get a summary page and then it's going to ask you to um, select your location and the time. And here you can see, this is kind of just a example. You can put in your zip code um, or your city. It's gonna show you all of the locations nearest you. 
And then it's going to ask you to select a time and a date that works for this applicant. And again, make sure that um, when the applicant goes to their appointment, that they present their state issued ID or their passport. They're going to need this when they get fingerprinted. If they don't have it, they're going to be turned away from fingerprinting. Um, so, you know, we just want to make sure they have everything so they only have to make one trip and they don't have to go back. Does anyone have any questions about the fingerprint appointment or, you know, what the applicant needs to take with them? Okay, and so the last step of completing your background checks are um, submitting your child maltreatment check. So like we said in the beginning, um, this is a separate system. So it's, it's through the uh, central registry here with the division. And you can see there's a couple of screenshots here of what those requests look like. Uh, we've also linked their portion of the website so that you'll have that direct information. And we've got their contact information here. Um, be sure that your applicants list five years of residency. This is where you're going to get the information if they've lived out of state or not. Um, so make sure that that is listed. And again, we have their contact information. If you have any issues with your child maltreatment or getting those submitted, please reach out to the central registry. I know they'll be happy to assist. Um, and your applicant will not be approved through our system if they do not have a child maltreatment on record. So um, the last thing that I want to talk about with the child maltreatment is make sure that you're selecting the correct um, reason for a request. So it's going to ask you, you know, why are you requesting this child maltreatment? The second option where it says a potential or current employee of a child care facility or residential facility for children youth licensed by the Department of Human Services. That's the option you should be selecting. Um, if you are selecting most of the other options, we're not going to have authorization to look at those. And so when we're adjudicating and we're going through your process, they may be in provisional and we can't approve them because we don't see that they have a cleared maltreatment. Um, we, can, we can get that cleared up. You can send us a copy, you can contact us um, and we can, we can fix that, but that's just a delay in the process. If it's already been done and it's already there in the system and it's been put under that second option, um, it's going to make that a lot faster for you guys to get those results back. So does anyone have any questions about the child maltreatment submissions? Okay. So we're going to talk just a second about the special conditions, and I kind of touched on this earlier. Um, some agencies require the submission of two background checks and two maltreatment checks for one applicant. And so those agencies are school districts, um, DDS providers, so Division of Developmental Disability um, Community Program Providers. Um, you may have multiple prefixes such as CHI, DDS, and then if you are with the school district, you may have like an EDU prefix for the Department of Education. Um, so if you have a teacher at a pre-K um, that is licensed by DHS on a school district campus, you would be submitting a background check through the Department of Education, but also that teacher would need a background check through the Division of Child Care. And so that's kind of where there are some, some differences. If you're not sure, um, you think that you should be doing two background checks or you're just not sure, um, about the prefixes or, or what you have, then please give us a call. We'll be happy to walk you know walk you through that. Um, we want to help and and make sure that you have everything that you need to be in compliance. Do we have any questions about that? All right, moving forward. So. Let's talk about the out-of-state requirements. Um, this is probably one of the larger delays once you've got everything done, um, are those applicants that have lived out of state in the last five years. 
So what do they need? They need a criminal background check, child maltreatment, and a sex offender registry check from the states that they have lived in the last five years. Um, now, all states are different, so you may not have to submit for all three of those things in each state. That is where a lot of the confusion is because every state is so different. So we do have a guide here. It's called the Interstate Child Care Background Check Contact List. And it does give you some guidance on what states, um, you know, require the need for the criminal child and sex offender, um, what states you'd only need the maltreatment sex offender. And so um, when you're looking at this guide, you're going to see there are some states listed in red. And those are NFF states. That is a national fingerprint file. So they, those states participate in that um, so that when our criminal is ran, it is including that state's criminal record. If they are not an NFF state, so uh, for example, Texas, not an NFF state, you would have to do the criminal, the child maltreatment, and the sex offender registry. Versus, for example, Colorado, they are an NFF state, you would only need the child maltreatment and the sex offender registry check. Um, this guide is great. It has lots of contact information, it has links. We also have created um, a portion of our website that we have dedicated to out of state. We do try to update it as frequently as we can and as often as we know there are changes. You can go on our website, select the state that your applicant came from, and it's gonna tell you exactly what you need. So it's gonna tell you if you need the criminal as well or just the maltreatment. It's gonna tell you the steps on how to complete it and what to do once you get those results. So we've tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, and, and so we do have that link and that'll be on the next slide. But I do wanna talk about you know exactly what you're needing. So if you have an applicant that has lived in Texas and Colorado, in the last five years. You have to get background checks for both of those states. So um, any questions about, you know, timelines or who needs an out of state? So um, out of state special conditions. So Oklahoma and Tennessee, you do not need to complete anything for those states. Um, our unit, we process those here. We have access to be able to run them uh, very quickly. So we actually do those for you. And then California is a closed record state. Um, so you do not need any records from California. And then Arizona will only release child abuse and neglect results. They are closed criminal record state. Um, and again, these are all listed on our, our link here. If you see in the middle of this slide where it says out of state background checks, Arkansas Department of Human Services, that's gonna take you to our website. When you click on each state, it's gonna tell you exactly what you need so that you're not left guessing on what, what you need. And then what about applicants who have lived in a different country? So no results are needed for applicants from out of the country. So there's nothing to worry about there. Um, and so all of these requirements come from the, the Office of Child Care. It's a requirement for the CCDF block grants. And you know, that, that money is the money that is gives us the option to do vouchers and to do, you know, um, different things when we, we provide funding with child care facilities. And so that's where these out-of-state requirements come from. They are in minimum licensing. It's just not as detailed as what we are explaining in this training. So if you have an applicant and maybe you're not sure exactly what you need or if you need out-of-state, um, as Brenda has said, you know, in the chat box, give us a call, call our main line, Tell them you need some help with background checks. They'll get you to whoever is available and we will be happy to help you. Um, if you know we're not available at that time, leave us a message. We, we make sure that we call app providers back at least three times a day. So we will get back with you if we're not able to answer you at that moment. So let's say you've submitted and you've gotten your out of state results. Now, what do you do with those? Um, you can mail a copy of the results and our, our address is here. However, the fastest way would be to send those by email. 
and some states uh, require it to be done digitally and they may ask for an email address to where to send the results. And so we have a dedicated mailbox. It's right here on our, on our slide. It's background check at dhs.arkansas.gov. You can send your results there and we will make sure and get those processed for you. Any questions? And Brenda actually processes all of our out-of-state results. So Brenda, do you have anything to add that I did not touch on for out-of-state? Um, I do not. If you have any questions, just feel free to give us a call and we'll talk with you. Um, it may sound like it's a confusing process, but it's not. We can walk you through it step-by-step step and we're glad to help you with that. So just give us a call. Thank you, Brenda. Okay, so we're almost to the end of our, our time here, but these are some things that we can't stress enough. So um, a staff member may not begin working until the Arkansas State Criminal Record Check has been returned as satisfactory. So what does that mean? That means that your overall NICAR status must be in a provisional status. The individual must always be supervised by staff um, and these staff must have approved background checks. So if you need to get somebody hired and, and you get them into provisional, that's great and they can begin working, but they cannot be left alone with children until they are overall approved. So if you see a pending status um, or not approved status, they cannot be working at your facility. You can log into your NICAR account to see the status of your applicant. Um, and again, this just says potential staff may not begin working while in a pending status. You'll go to your history tab and, and you'll be able to put in the applicant's name, um, you know, or their social or their search ID, pull it up and you'll see that overall status. It needs to be provisional or approved. So um, please make sure that all your information is correct before submitting. The applicant's name and date of birth must match their state issued ID or passport. Uh, please notify the background check unit when a staff member is no longer employed if they are in a provisional status. So if an applicant's waiting on out of state or they haven't gotten fingerprinted and they're in provisional and they I'm so sorry, I had to sneeze. And they decide to leave and they never get fingerprinted or let's say you part ways with them and they, they haven't gotten fingerprinted and they're still in that provisional status. Um, give us a call, send us an email, let us know that they're no longer employed there and we can not approve them and kind of get them out of that provisional waiting period. We hope to eventually have like an archive option that'll be helpful, but um, that's what we want to do to make sure that they're not just hanging out in that provisional queue. So let us know. And then when you email us, um, try to include your search ID number. That'll help us find the applicant a lot faster. Uh, there sometimes will be lots of duplicate names. Or maybe that applicant has worked at several different facilities. Um, so if you'll include that search ID number, it will help us greatly to get things done faster for you. And then we've got our phone number there on the team on the screen again. Um, background check team, we're happy to help. And then we're gonna I'm gonna put some more important phone numbers up here for you. So if you're needing help with your subscription account, so if you're needing help with um, invoices or payments, or if you're needing help with getting your password or your username information, or you're just having some technical difficulties with the system, you can contact the NICAR um, like subscription account help desk. And then there's the NICAR help desk, which would be for some other you know, technical issues that you may be having. And then we've also got the central registry listed there. So the last thing that I want to talk about are possible delays in the process. So um, these are all reasons that you may have a delay in getting your background checks completed. And um, once you submit your applicant into the system, it immediately goes through the state police. Um, if everything is, is matching, it's done instantly, and then it comes over to our side. 
we um, are going to process those within 24 business hours. So if you submit on Friday, it's going to be Monday. But if you submit on Monday, you should get it a, a minimum of a provisional status the next day on Tuesday. Now, what can cause a delay in not getting that done in, in that amount of time? If there is some more information that we're needed um, from the state criminal, you may still see a pending um, applicant after those 24 to 72 hours. If they're not approved, it may be because they have an incomplete consent form. The notary stamp may not be legible. It may be missing altogether. Um, the wrong form could have been uploaded. Uh, notary dates don't match. Uh, we talked about that earlier about the notary section needs to be complete and accurate. The wrong name or the date of birth was entered into NICAR. Uh, the applicant was submitted more than once. So if it's a duplicate entry, uh, we will not approve the duplicates and only work that one where they're um, where they've been submitted. So another reason you may get a not approved is if uh, fingerprints or the child maltreatment have not been completed within 45 days of submission. So once you submit your applicant, I would recommend to um, make sure that you do your child maltreatment the same day, uh, preferably before, but if you do it at the same time, you're right there at the computer, you're getting all this done, go ahead and do your child maltreatment at the same time you submit your applicant, and then go ahead and get them fingerprinted. If you can do it the same day, that's great. If not, try to do it within at least the next few days. If you wait, um, after 45 days, it will be not approved. So those are just some errors. Um, most of these, aside from that last one with the 45 days, those are going to happen within the first 24 to 72 hours of you submitting. If you have incorrect information and you submit someone today and tomorrow you get a not approval, it is 100% because there is an issue. Either it's a duplicate entry, information is incorrect, or the consent form is incorrect. It has nothing to do with that person's background check. So just, I like to make that clear because a lot of times, um, you know, we put that not approval on there and maybe providers aren't really sure. So give us a call. You can call us and say, hey, I got this not approval. I just submitted it yesterday you know, what's going on with it, and we will be happy to take a look and let you know, oh, you know, the, the consent form is missing this, you can email it to us, we can get it taken care of. Um, it's going to be a significant more amount of time when it comes to the background check, because we give that applicant due process. So provisional delays, what can make your applicant stay in a provisional status? Um, if the fingerprints have not been completed, so if it says fingerprints are pending, that means they have not been fingerprinted. Uh, fingerprints are rejected, so they're having to go back a second time using that E number from Arkansas State Police. And that's just gonna take some additional time because they do have to mail a hard copy of the results to us. And then uh, it also could be provisional because maybe the federal report requires some additional information from the applicant and we've sent them a letter. Uh, they could be in provisional because the child maltreatment has not been completed or because they need out of state information. So those are some reasons for provisional delays. Does anyone have any questions about delays in the process or what um, you could possibly need to get them approved? Okay. Do we have any questions about anything that we talked about or anything that we did not talk about? Okay, and if you have any questions, you know, after um, we leave this, this meeting, if you have questions later on, please give us a call. You have our contact information. Um, and again, if you would like a copy of this, please put your email in the chat box before we end the meeting. Um, 
reach out to us anytime. We're here to help. We, we want to guide you on this process and make it as simple and smooth um, as we can. So give us a call, send us an email, any questions that you have. Um, and if that, there are no questions, then we will conclude this meeting. And thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to be here. Um, if you have, you know, friends, coworkers in the, the early childhood profession that you think would benefit from this, feel free to let them know that we do it every month. We do it on the last Thursday of the month. So I hope that we see you next month. Have a great uh, weekend and thank you again for being here.